at Honestly Adoption, we condemn racism and the systems that have sustained it. We believe that black voices and narratives need to be the norm in our everyday life, in television, movies, literature, friendship, education, and history books, and here on our podcast. We're going to do something special, something unique over the next several weeks here on this show. Uh, We're actually going to be airing past podcast episodes that we have done over the last couple of years with Black Voices. Now, these episodes are not necessarily race-focused conversations. These are conversations with people that uh, we're honored to call friends. Uh, We're going to air an interview with a foster parent, an adoptive parent, uh, an adoptee, Uh, adults. Uh, One of our interviews is an adult who spent time in foster care and we're even airing a a past episode that we did, which is a really fun episode uh, with an expert on hair care. Now, if you jump over to honestlyadoption.com, we're actually going to be linking to all of our guests' uh, services, uh, social media accounts, plus some other favorite uh, sites that uh, we are following on our Instagram page that we really believe everybody needs to be following um, because they educate, they prompt, they push us towards uh, a deeper understanding. Welcome to the Honestly Adoption Podcast, the show that gives hope and insight from real voices on the foster and adoption journey. Pull up a chair. We're glad you could join us. Here are your hosts, Mike and Kristen Berry. Hey friends, welcome back to the Honestly Adoption Podcast. We are so glad you have joined us for this show. And if this is your first time checking out the podcast, welcome. We're glad you guys are here. You can learn more about us by visiting honestlyadoption.com, subscribe to the podcast, Check out some of our featured resources, even catch up on some of our past episodes. Listen, today we have a great interview. Kristen had a chance to sit down with Tori Peterson. Tori is a former foster youth, and her goal is uh, to spread hope. Um, She is all about foster care, adoption, pro-life, family. She's amazing. She's a public speaker traveling the country. Um, Unfortunately, we haven't crossed paths with her at any events yet because she's amazing, but hopefully we'll get to do that. You guys will love this interview. And listen, again, make sure you check out honestlyadoption.com. Uh, leave us a review and listen. If you subscribe to the podcast to get our email updates when we when we publish new, publish new shows, uh, we send you a free gift, free ebook, right? Because everybody loves free. All right, guys. Listen. Thanks for being here. And now on with the interview. Tori, I am so excited to have you here, and I'm so excited to introduce you to our listeners. Thank you for being here today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm honored to be here. I found you on Instagram um, just a few months ago, and I was just excited to um, to read about your story. I love how you share with such vulnerability. Um, and I just, I love your perspective. You are an adult adoptee. Uh, former foster youth, um, and your mom, you're a, a new mom to an adorable little guy, oh. newly married. Mm-hmm. So you have a lot going on. And I've just really enjoyed um, just getting to see from the outside a little bit about your life. Can you share with us um, a little bit about who you are? Who's in your family? Yeah, of course. So that's where most people find me is Instagram. And I'm going to give myself a shameless plug here. Follow me, Tori Hope Peterson, and Peterson is with all E's, S-E-N. And what I do right now is I speak and I do advocacy for the preservation of the family, foster care, adoption, and a little bit of the controversial stuff, life stuff. And I am a mom to a 14-month-old boy. His name is Leander, and I'm a wife. To Jacob, my husband. I love that. I love all of it. And yes, please promote yourself. <laughs> that is what we're about. I, I think it's it's all about connection. And that's something that we think is so valuable in this community is connecting our listeners to other people and to other voices um, and to hearing 
all of it, all perspectives. Yeah. I, I love that. I feel like I've just been a part of this foster adult adoptee community for just a short time, really. And it is so awesome. The people that you meet, it is so rich. I've loved it. I love it too. And as a mom of older kids, so I have, um, my older daughters are 33 and 29. And then my teenage daughters are now just about to turn 18 and 19. And I just see so much value in this community for them. Mm -hmm. Um, For us, it was about just kind of feeling lost as parents and connecting to other parents. And then our world just began to open up and we saw, um, you know, not just other foster and adoptive parents, but adult adoptees, um, birth parents, um, therapists, professionals, you know, just kind of joining into this community. And I think for us, it's been really valuable. Mm -hmm. What I love is for my daughters who are um, beginning to be able to connect on social media, especially, I mean, the world just gets a little smaller, I think, um, but be able to see that there are people who have gone before them and there are other people out there experiencing so many of the same things. And I think that's incredibly valuable for them too. Yeah. That a reminder that they're not alone Yeah, because our stories are very unique and they're very different. And when someone asks how many siblings you have, it's like, uh, what do I say here? But then there are other people who now when I have this community and when I'm asked that my answer is seen as normal. I yes. Love I love that you said the siblings. Cause that's one thing. I don't know why that comes up around the dinner table a lot in our house. It's like, well, I have 11 siblings. Well, I have seven. Well, I have two. Well, I have 14, you know, and then they're, well, I have three biological siblings and seven adopted siblings. And, you know, and I'm not even sure if my dad has other kids, you know, so it is that kind of, but it's normal here. And then when my kids say it, say in the first grade classroom, all of a sudden, all eyes are on them. What do you mean you have 11, but you've never met your baby sister, you know, and I do. I think that's a conversation that comes up quite a bit for our kids too. And I love when they can be with other adoptees. Um, yeah. And yeah. be able to it's, say, this is normal. It's normal. This is who we are. Yeah. It's just such a casual question. So it gets asked all the time. You know, it's one of those mm-hmm. intro questions. Like, where did you grow up? Where are you from? How many siblings do you have? Well, <laughs> interesting I, that you ask. <laughs> yeah. I was answering this question just the other day. And it just opens up such, it opens up everything because I have to say, well, I have a biological half sister who's nine and a half years younger than me. I have a youth leader who has a daughter who always calls me her sister. And I have to call her my sister because she calls me her sister, you know, and she looks up to me and she loves me in that way. So I say, she's my sister. And then I have two sisters into the family I was adopted into as an adult. And then when I found all the ancestry stuff for my dad, I found out that I have a much older sister than me. So I have all sisters and they all come from different parts of me, different parts of families. And I'm so blessed to have all these different families, but explaining it yes. can be kind of awkward sometimes. For the person who was just asking if you had two siblings. Right. Yeah. It's always like, they, you they got just, a lot more than you bargained for. Yeah. They just expected me to say, I have a sister and a brother. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you did not know what you were asking. Yeah. It's funny. We have um, one, two of our children have a biological sister who has spent time living with us off and on since she was born. And at some point you have to put some type of title on that because it's so confusing everywhere you go. You know, um, who's picking you up from school today? Oh, my biological half sisters, adoptive mom from, you know, and so she just calls us aunt and uncle, but then it does, it leads to the further questions. And one day she was introducing a biological cousin to another one of our children. And she said, um, Oh, this is my biological cousin. So-and-so, and and this is my non-biological cousin. So-and-so. And And it's like, 
the conversation is so confusing to everybody else, but to her, she needed to have a, a way to categorize everyone. And so in our house, she has two siblings and six cousins. So, and that's the title that works for her. So I love when, I love when our kids can just be with other kids too, and not have to explain anything. It's just normal. When did you first find a community like that, where you were talking to other people who you didn't have to back up and explain? It's been very recent. So when I became a mom, I had this feeling and I felt like there was a community of people telling me that I kind of needed to stop telling my story. I needed to stop using my voice and I needed to just settle down and be a mom. And then my husband encouraged me to go to this conference. It's called the Global Leadership Summit. And God just made it very clear to me that that is n- not what he said to me. Yeah. <laughs> like he, he never said that. <laughs> People said that. Yeah. And God was like, this is what I have called you to get up, pick up the cross and start telling the story that I have given you. And I was like, oh, okay. I was very convicted. And I asked, what do I have? to tell this story, like what platform do I have? And I was like, well, the best thing I got right now is Instagram. Yeah. So that's what I started using. And since I started telling my story, there has just been this community of foster parents, adopted parents, former foster youth, current foster youth, who just send me messages, ask me questions, tell me about their lives, wanting to know about my life, how I've gotten to where I am. And it's so comforting that the conversations are so normal. And I think, so my, me and my my husband also just moved to a new town. We've been here, we've been here now for almost a year, but I think now is when things are kind of finally being normal Mm -hmm. and people know now that I'm not someone to talk about the weather, if you're talking about the weather, I'm probably going to walk away. Right. I have better things to do. Yeah. <laughs> so people know, like, if I'm talking to Tori, I'm probably going to be uncomfortable. I'm probably going to have to be a little bit vulnerable or I'm going to have to listen to her be vulnerable. And people always thank me like, oh, Tori, thank you so much for your vulnerability. And I think part of it is vulnerability, but like part of it that like, this is just my life. This is just the life I've lived. And to tell it means to be vulnerable. Yeah. That really leads into uh, some things that I think are, um, our foster and adoptive parents are going to resonate with. And that is that, um, your story is vulnerable. I think all of our stories are vulnerable. That's true. Uh, you know, and how much do we share? I guess we have to decide some things are tricky and hard. Um, but you have shared some things that are pretty difficult publicly just about where you've come from and, um, some hard things that you've experienced in life. And for those of us raising kids who have some of those tough parts of their stories, how can we encourage our children? Um, Oh, to take the power over that, to take ownership over their story. Um, not to push them to share when they're not ready. That's not what I mean. How can we really encourage our kids as they walk through all of the ins and outs of where they've come from, the parts that they feel proud about and the parts that they feel ashamed about or, um, or how can we help them move past that shame? Um, the, the parts that, that they didn't have ownership over uh, things that have happened to our kids that were hundred percent out of their control. What are some things we can do as foster and adoptive parents to support our children while they work through the details of every place that they've come from? Yeah. Me personally, I feel like counseling and journaling have been really good avenues to process my story because I think that, and I think that's important because I, think that every foster youth, every 
adopted youth, they have a story to tell. And I really think that that's where we find our empowerment, where we find our inspiration is in how, how is this story that has been very hard and challenging, how is it good? How has it made me who I am? The good parts of who I am. Yeah. And even the really sad and bad parts, I think, I still think that processing through those and being able to communicate, being taught, like, this is really hard. And communicating that with other people who have been through the same thing, seeing that even maybe like we don't see how it's made good exactly, but being able to relate to one another and saying, I went through the same thing and seeing another person not be alone because of it. And I know in the end that is seeing the good in it. Yeah. But I guess that is the center of how do we encourage, how do we inspire foster youth, adopted youth? is it's perspective. I know that's so corny and people always say everything is perspective. I don't believe that everything is perspective because we live in reality. But I do believe that if we can say this really sad, bad thing has been made good or it's going to be used for good or if we can just use it to relate to another human being to show them that they're not alone that that's how we can empower and encourage our foster youth so I think part of it just showing teaching our youth how to have the hard conversation and how to tell their story I've always wanted to like have a workshop and kind of fabricate a way of like how do we tell our stories Mm -hmm in a way that empowers and encourages us in a way that glorifies God. If we're religious people in a way that encourages other people. So it's not just about us. Mm -hmm. We were talking with therapist one time um, who encouraged us to, to not rescue our child from the hard part of their story. And I found that to be one of the most freeing and difficult things um, that we've ever faced as parents Um, because I love my kids unconditionally and to the ends of the earth and I would do anything to go back and change the stuff that happened to them and so when our kids are feeling all the feelings I'm a feelings person so I can appreciate that I feel all the feelings (laughs) but when our kids are feeling all the feelings and the words are coming out, um, maybe the details of something really hard that happened to them, and then maybe um, some feelings that they have toward us. It might start with, you know, I'm a bad person and nobody loves me, and, you know, nobody came back for me, and I hate you, and you're not my mom, and, you know, no one is ever going to love me, and, you know, and, 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 and we're listening to all this hard stuff, I think it can be really, for me, I want to jump in and say, no, 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 no. You're amazing. And you're exactly the person you were supposed to be. And I love you. And God loves you. And daddy loves you. And and we, you know, list, here are your 25 top things I love about you. But in listening to this therapist say, don't rescue, we can say those things, but first listen to the whole thing. I thought, oh, wow, I hadn't thought about the fact that when I'm talking about the hard parts of my story, I want to tell the whole story from start to finish, Mm -hmm. even the hard stuff. And I'm strong enough to handle my own emotions around that. Mm -hmm. And when I do, when I get to the end of the story, I feel better. And so allowing our kids to work through all of that to say, you know, I'm nothing and nobody loves me, to listen to your child Mm -hmm. say that is the worst feeling but to let them say it and let it sit in the air for a minute and let them tell the whole story. I, I, I love that. We've really been practicing a lot more um, at our house, just listening to the whole thing, because the truth is most of us will cycle back around. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not worthless. 
I'm actually pretty great. <laughs> you know, I'm here for a reason. I've got a job to do. So I, I love that. Yeah. And that even reminds me of our first point of when we get asked how many siblings we have, because sometimes when people do ask me questions, I feel like my answer is too long. I'm not going to tell the whole story. And so I think as foster and adoptive parents or just as caregivers of these children or people who just care about them, letting them know we want to hear your full answer. We want to hear your full story. We're here to listen the whole time, no matter how long it is. Like I am hanging on your every word. If someone told me that, I think I would talk a lot longer. I would talk a lot deeper, but oftentimes I think this is just a casual conversation and this person is not expecting me to tell them that I have 11 siblings from a million different places. I I love that. If, if somebody were, were to say, I'm hanging on your every word. And I think that's such a valuable piece of advice for us as foster and adoptive parents, um, for us as parents, Um, Who wouldn't want somebody to look at us and say, I'm hanging on your every word. I value everything that you're about to say. I think that's fantastic. Got me kind of choked up and now I got distracted (laughs) to where I was going. (laughs) I I love that. I I think, um, talked a little, I actually want to ask you, um, okay, you have presented policy to Congress and White House policy staffers about how to reduce abuse and neglect in foster care. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, there was a summer I worked for the Congressional Coalition on Adoption Institute and House Majority with Steve Scalise. And I wrote a policy that said that CASAs, so those listening, CASAs are court-appointed special advocates, and they are basically lawyers for children, and their job description is to advocate for what is in the best interest of the child. And I advocated that they are a part of investigations and that they are mandated reporters, because in most states, CASAs are actually not mandated reporters of abuse and neglect, and they do not go alongside law enforcement and caseworkers to investigate abuse and neglect within foster homes, but it is necessary that they do because CASAs advocate for what is in the best interest of the child, while law enforcement and caseworkers have a little bit of conflict of interest because they're working for the county and the state. They have quotas. They need to keep a certain amount of foster homes in the area and say there's like 10 kids in one home. And you have to terminate that home because you find abuse and neglect. It's the caseworker's job to find a home for 10 kids in one night. And that is nearly impossible, especially if you live in a small town and you don't have that many foster homes. So I advocated that CASAs are a part of this investigation, a part of this process. And I actually also just wrote um, a testimony um, and testified, I'm going to testify for a bill in Virginia about CASAs being a part of the home study process because it takes so long because CASAs just, or because caseworkers just have such large caseloads. And so I really think that CASAs in general should be a part of more work that the caseworkers do. It's hard because CASAs in a lot of states aren't paid. Right. But I think, I think we could really pour, you know, like, I think we could pour more money into CASAs as a, as a society, as a culture, as people, because we're, we're either spending our tax dollars on foster youth going into a broken system, or we can be paying for our tax dollars for foster youth being taken care of well, and then less going into the foster care system because these, foster kids who become parents know how to take care of their kids well because they were raised well. Right. It's a cyclical, it's a cyclical thing. And, and you point to just much more complex system and 
um, need for restoration in that system and, and need to just really overhaul so many parts of it. But I love that you focused in on that one particular um, part of the system, which is the CASAs. Yeah, I have a GAL, so that's a guardian ad litem, and their jobs are very similar, but guardian ad litems, I believe, are paid, and mm-hmm. they have a law degree, and I just think that GALs and CASAs have to be a part of more, because my GAL, she was rocking. Like, mm-hmm. she was the most amazing person in my caseload, and so we, me and my mom, we first went to court, and had a GAL. She was trying into a room to ask me questions and my mom was following us around and she was threatening us. So we like couldn't get in a room and the GAL, um, we finally got in a room and then, you know, she was asking me questions. I was answering them about my home life, talking about some of the abuse and neglect. And then we walked out of the door and my mom was right there. And the GAL looked at me and she said, this case is crazy your mom is crazy and no one is going to take this. And then she walked away and she wasn't my GAL anymore. (laughs) And then, so the court, because it was my right to have a GAL, we didn't go through with the court case. And that's when I went into, I went into foster care that day. The judge was like, you can't go back home. You gotta, you gotta go somewhere else. So then I came back to court and I had a new GAL and she took me to the room and she said, I'm not going anywhere. I'm staying here until you emancipate. And this case is not crazy enough for me and you are worth this. Wow. And she was just so assertive. She made it so clear to me. And in my, in my heart, I thought, yeah, that's what a lot of people have said. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Not like bitter, just like, that's just kind of what I thought. That's just, okay. Thank you. That was very kind. But then she did. She stayed the whole time. She was my greatest advocate and she always wanted what was best for me. She was phenomenal. Wow. Wow. What an incredible story. And I think too, I I love that you're talking about the potential for more funding, for more education. You know, if if our guardian ad litems and our CASAs are are educated to understand, you know, childhood trauma and family dynamics and the way that the foster care system works, you know, how many more, um, how many more people would step forward for a youth and stick it out like that? I think that would be incredible. And we've actually known, um, one of ours was working a part-time job at, uh, the movie theater the other day. And we went to see a movie on Christmas day and there she was. And she had been such an incredible influence, um, with our son when he was in foster care and to see her just light up. He's now just about to turn 11 and, um, we had lost touch with her or connected with her on Facebook, but she was working this part-time job and at the movie theater on Christmas day. And we ran into her and what a delightful surprise, um, for, for her to be able to see our son who didn't really remember her. He was just a baby. Um, but for us to be able to see a person that really spoke so clearly on behalf of our child seven years ago. Um, that was a pretty incredible thing. So I agree with you. It it is such an incredible job and, um, really so important, such a vital piece of the whole system for sure. Question for you. Do you feel tired? What about plain exhausted? You don't know if you have the energy to go one more step Listen, if that's you, I want you to know you're not alone. We have felt that so many times uh, in our parenting journey. Uh, we've looked at our lives and felt like, man, we have no energy. Uh, we, we've lost our focus, and we just were looking for something to help us, something to guide us. Well, listen, if you felt that way, I want to invite you to join Self Care Workshop. We just opened up enrollment for this, and Self Care Workshop is created to help you better care for yourselves so you can better care for your children. And here's the best part. Self-care workshop gives you a simple framework you can apply to your life while you stay hands-on caring for your children. Visit selfcareworkshop.org to learn all about it today. And listen, 
Enrollment's open for just a few more days. If you're listening to this episode on the day it publishes, we're closing down um, enrollment soon, so make sure you check it out, selfcareworkshop.org. Get better, better care for you so you can better care for your children. That's what it's all about. And now, back to the show. So you have been a respite provider. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah. So the first time my husband and I ever did respite, we had, he was a four-year-old little girl and then her, he was probably eight months, little brother. And my husband did most of the baby stuff and I played with the little girl. And then my son, Leander, and her they were like playing with this curtain and just like swooshing it back and forth because it, it was a curtain not on a window but in between a doorway because um, my husband has had an office space and so kind of like to shut it off so we put a curtain there and they were like you know playing like kind of like a quick peekaboo with it but it, it, the peekaboo just kept getting faster and faster and faster and then the curtain fell down and the little girl covered her face so quickly and all of the thoughts that went through my head went through my head so fast that the first thing I saw was my little sister who poured a gallon of milk on the floor and just freaked out, crumbled, started crying. And I knew when she did that, you know, when I was like 11, 12, it was because she was expecting my mom to scream at her because that's what we went through. My mom wasn't there. I was watching my sister at the time. And so I just said, it's okay. You know, we just clean up the milk. And then I pictured my mom yelling at me for something small. And then I just saw this little girl with her hands continuing to cover her face and she was peeking, you know, through her fingers at me, seeing what I was about to do. And I just said, Hey, it happens. It's okay. And I, you know, she was on the floor. So I scooped to her level and I said, we were just having a lot of fun. And Jacob wasn't home. He had left at the time. And I said, Jacob's going to put it right back up when he gets back and we can play with it again. And we'll just play with it gentler. Mm -hmm. And she just like perked up and was like, okay you know she was just like so happy and she continued playing and in that moment you know that quote people say be the person you needed at that age yeah. or be the person you need at that stage of life and I just thought thank you God thank you God that you have made me the person that I needed at this age yeah and so that was a very sometimes I really doubt myself like I doubt my healing and have my redemption, all these things. I always, I always doubt it. Like, am I, how much am I really struggling? Um, I probably still have so much and I do, right. I do have so much healing left to do actually. And, but I, I just think, oh, I'm, I'm probably much worse off than I think. I, I struggle with imposter syndrome greatly. And in that moment, I just think there was a twinge of healing. That mm -hmm. God was like, you're okay. Like, I yeah. Got you. You're okay. And I think that's such a beautiful um, uh, representation of what you were telling about earlier, that you are using your story and your experiences to, to change things, to change life for somebody else and for yourself. Um, I, I love that, that your response to that past trauma uh, spurred you on to, to respond to that little girl in a different way. I love that. Thank you. So you were adopted as an adult or as an older child? I was an, adopted as an adult when I was 18. Okay. So I ran track in high school and I lived in 12 different homes throughout foster care and even though I moved a lot, my caseworkers tried to keep me in the same school mm -hmm. because I was 
I did well academically and I had a good track team and I was, I would say that I was like a leader of that mm-hmm. track team. And I think my caseworkers really wanted me to stay in that role right. and continue to empower me and encourage me in that way. And, you know, I, looking back, I don't know if they were doing this, but I also had a mentor that would be my track coach. He was the most consistent adult in my life because throughout all the moves, even though I moved a ton, I, I stayed in the school and I had him as my coach mm-hmm. for the three years that I was at that school. So he, I, I emancipated out of care when I turned 18. He would drive me to and from like wherever I was staying that night. I didn't really have like a consistent place, which I know sounds really bad, but like I actually kind of enjoyed it. <laughs> so for all those people like, oh my gosh, she was homeless. I was, but it wasn't like the worst thing in the world. Right. <laughs> I had a lot of freedom and in foster care, I was so isolated. So I was like, this is awesome <laughs> as an 18 year old girl, you know? Right. So um, he would drive me to and from, and the summer, I should give a little bit of preface. The summer before that, he was like, Tori, I think you can win state and I think you can get a scholarship to college. And I had never even been to state individually. So that was kind of a very far fetched thing that he said. But he added like a caveat and he was like, if you do everything that I say, Mm -hmm. and I was like, well, I'm just going to do everything that he says. And like, if it doesn't happen, then it's his fault. So (laughs) again, again, like my ordinary 18 year old self and I did everything he said and I trained really hard and I worked really hard and he was driving me to and from the houses, you know, after practice and he was like, Tori, you've got to get in a consistent home. Like if you want to win state, you can't be sleeping on floors. Mm -hmm. There was one time I like slept in a basement with a lot of mold in it and I had a really bad allergic reaction. I've never had an allergic reaction before this mold and I had to go to the hospital and stuff. It was pretty crazy. And he was like, you gotta get in a consistent home. And he's like, I can't take you in now because I'm your track coach and liability stuff. But after the state track meet, if you want to be a part of our family, I asked my daughters, you are welcome to be a part of our family. And when, after, when you go to college, if you go to college, you can always come back to our home and you will celebrate holidays with us, whatever you need. Mm -hmm. We got you basically. And again, it was like one of those times with the GAL where I was like, that's really nice. Mm -hmm. A lot of people have said that. Thank you. Um, but then it did happen. I moved yeah. in. I Well, first I did. I won state. I became a five-time state champion, which was crazy. That's and awesome. I did. I got a full ride to college, which is what is probably the one of the very, is one of the reasons I have, I am a part of the 3% of youth, foster youth who get a bachelor's degree or higher. And I mean, this man, he was just so amazing. Scott is so amazing. He got me matching. I don't know why this is such a big deal to me. It's, it's something I always use. I just love it. He got me matching stockings for his daughters, you know, because some people use yeah. stockings like all their entire upbringing, but he changed their stockings so that my match them. That meant a lot. That. And he would always get me, he was so good at getting gifts. It was like he knew me my entire life. So I'd come home for Christmas and he'd get me these gifts that I didn't even know I wanted. But then I would open them and I'd be like, how'd you know I want this? (laughs) Yeah. He he would drive so far to come to my track meets and he would come to my track banquets. I mean, he was just awesome. And then he, he walked me down the aisle when I got married his two daughters were in my in my wedding so yeah they really have been my family and then during my first year of college we didn't do an official legal adult adoption to me it was an adoption but an adult adoption in Ohio is like really expensive I don't know why and instead he was like well do you just want to take our last name and so we did because that was way cheaper and so we went to the court and we paid for my last name to become their last name. And 
to me, even though it wasn't like this official adoption, right. it's always meant so much more to me. I think that people, I think that adult adoption, like the process of that is important because it's, it's like marriage. Like you have that kind of covenant. Right. But there has also been this thing that's always, it's always been very special to me because it shows that he chooses me no matter what. Like we did not do right. a legal thing, but right. he, he still chooses me and sacrifices things for me. Last summer, uh, and sometimes I think to myself too, like, am I really a part of this family? Am I really a part of it? And then last summer, I live in Minnesota now. He lives in Ohio. Last summer, he drove 12 hours here and back. So 24 hours total with his daughter and my grandma, who would be his mom, to come see me. And it's those things that I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, I am a part. I am a part of this family. Right. We belong here. But it is this constant, even though like in my heart of hearts, I know it. And he yeah. has never done anything to really contradict that. I'm, I'm always reassured when the actions are there. Right. Because I'm always questioning it. <laughs> yeah. We are also parents of an adult adoptee and our daughter was 25 when she asked to be adopted Mm -hmm. and it was very similar to your story. She just um, started staying with us. We were youth pastors at the time. She started staying with us on the couch, you know, and then we had an extra room and so we just started calling it Rachel's room (laughs) and then she just stayed and she was there when we brought our our other children home. She was there when we became foster parents. She was there um, when her mom passed away. And then she was just there. And then one day she was like, I want the piece of paper that says that I belong. Mm -hmm. Um, So that was just kind of an extra like surprise. I think for us, it was just so, of course she was part of our family. Like that was not even a question. My kids expected her to be there. That was their big sister. But then, yeah, she just wanted, she wanted the piece of paper that said, these are my brothers and sisters. This is my mom and dad. So I love that. And the, the extra blessing of having grandkids, um, that's been super exciting for us too. So kind of that added surprise you guys have, I didn't know you had grandkids. Yeah, we have four. Okay. Um, So we have, and actually our oldest daughter just became a foster mom also. Mm -hmm. And so, um, she has one biological son and then she brought home, uh, her foster son back in the spring and, you know, foster and adoption is one of those things that just your circle just widens and widens and widens. And, um, her foster son is actually the biological sibling of my best friend's foster son. Wow. That'll make, remember the complicated yeah. conversations that only make sense in our community. Right. And they just, they could not take another child and they were scrambling. What do we do? You know, this new baby is born and we want him to be able to have contact with his sibling, but we just can't. They have a lot of medical special needs and a big family and they were just stretched. And they were like, what are we going to do? And after just exhausting every possibility, just calling everybody they knew, we were talking one day and I was like, do you want me to call my daughter? She's always said she wanted to be a foster parent. Maybe, maybe today's the day. And so we gave them a call. And after she and her husband talked it over, they, they were licensed, like immediately they got permission to be in the NICU with the baby and be able to hold him until he was discharged. And so anyway, that brings us to four grandchildren. And I think that's one of those crazy, weird, cool things about being a foster family also is that our family makes literally no sense to anybody else. But to us, it's like, well, obviously that's my grandson. So, <laughs> right. <laughs> right. You can't tell. I love when my kids are out in public. We were actually just in an adoption event um, in our community, we, we work with the Children's Bureau. And um, so all these adoptive families were at Sky Zone the other day. And it's so great because it's like that time that you say, oh yeah, that's my brother over there. And nobody questions it because every family in there was like, oh yeah, that makes perfect sense. Yeah. Like, yeah. 
obviously that's your brother and that's your mom and you're related to half the people in this building and it totally makes sense. So I love that. Yeah. Thank you so much. I, I just, I have so many more questions. So maybe if you have time, we, we can do this again sometime. I think our listeners are just going to love everything about you. You're love great. that you shared so much. Yeah, I would love to be here again. Let's do it again. Why not? All right, let's definitely do it again. Where can our listeners connect with you? And all of these will be in the show notes too. So we'll have um, your blog, your Instagram, the best places to connect with you. But just so our listeners can hear it out loud again, where can they get connected with you? Yeah, so Instagram is probably where I'm most active. So again, that's Tori, T-O-R-I, Hope, H-O-P-E, Peterson, P-E-T-E-R-S-E-N. And then I have a blog called Tori Stories. So it's T-O-R-I-S and then stories has no E, S-T-O-R-I-S dot WordPress dot com. And I'm also on Facebook. Just look up Victoria Hope Peterson. I'll be your friend. I'll add you. (laughs) That sounds good. Well, Tori, thank you so so much for sharing this time with us. We appreciate you so much. Thank you, Tori.